And welcome back to footballnewsnow.com. I am senior writer Chuck Carroll. Joining me, a good friend to the site, a good friend to Raider Nation, Mr. Jerry Cardoza of RaiderNews.com. Jerry, how are you, sir? I'm doing good, Chuck. How are you today? I'm doing great. You know, we got a little bit of football on the tube. There was a big upset yesterday. Two of them, actually. Jerry, who actually saw the Seattle Seahawks pulling that upset win yesterday? Well, nobody did, but even even I knew. The Seahawks are Jekyll and Hyde. They're one team at home. They're a different team on the road, and Questfield's a tough place to play, and the Saints did look on paper like they were, you know, so much better, but they didn't have many running backs. That hurt them bad. But their defense is what cost them the game, though. They gave up 41 points. Matt Hasselbeck had the game of his career yesterday. I think well, he- he's capable. He's had, he can light you up. Hey, that's, that's why they play. We're talking with Jerry Cardoza, the head honcho over at RaiderNews.com, and we've been talking general NFL in the playoffs so far, but let's turn our attention to something that you know an awful lot about, and that is, of course, the Oakland Raiders. And let's forget about the coaching situation for a second and talk about the bombshell that dropped this morning, uh, and that is the void of Namdi Asamoah's contract out there. Uh, He's an unrestricted free agent. The Raiders can neither franchise tag him nor transition tag him. Uh, Jerry, he's good to go to walk out the door as soon as a new CBA, you know, happens here. I mean, how big of a deal is this for the Raiders? And aside from the coach, should this be their top priority? Uh, Yeah, I think it should be their top priority, and I'm not convinced Namdi will want to walk out. He may want a new contract <laughs> but he's never made any overtures about wanting to leave the Raiders in any way and as far as the coaching thing the players will get over that real quick they always do and uh, I'd really be surprised if Nandi goes somewhere else <laughs> he already is the highest paid DB in the league you know they accused Al of messing up exclusive tags franchise tags for DBs by paying Nandi so much so uh, but he, obviously he's worth it. Him and uh, Revis, whenever they play, whoever they play, those guys don't do much that day. Well, the contract was uh, voided because he played fewer downs in 2010 than he did in 2009. Um, and as you and I discussed off the air, that you know was largely due in part to the fact that he only played in 14 games because of a high ankle sprain. That is why. But here's the interesting thing. Had he, you know, not had his contract voided, he would have been in line for a huge option that would have paid him $16.8 million or the value of the quarterback franchise tag that year, whichever would have been higher. That's a lot of money. Is Al Davis willing to back up the truck a second time for this guy, do you think? That's a good question because um, the Raiders still have to get Seymour back, too, so... Maybe Al wasn't willing to pay him that much money. I don't know. It, it's The Raiders are, uh, you know, they've got a lot of potential. They've got a good young team, and yet they seem to have these uh, dysfunctional problems that always pop up. No doubt. Well, let's talk about the other elephant in the room, and uh, some might view this as uh, as another dysfunctional problem, and, and that would be the ousting of Tom Cable as uh, head coach. He's dismissed after going 8-8. Eight and eight. He leads the record, uh, the Raiders to their best record since 2002, not to mention the fact that they go 6-0 and oh against AFC West opponents. Was it a mistake on Al Davis's part not to pick up the uh, two-year option on Cable's contract? Well, you know, I, that's another good question because I've always – I've never been a staunch Cable supporter myself, and – the thing that's getting overlooked here is they went six and zero in division and only went eight and eight. Then that means they were two and eight outside of their division, and that's pathetic. And so maybe Davis saw that as a more of a problem than the fact that they went six and zero in their division against three teams that. I mean, let's face it, the AFC West is probably the second weakest division compared next to the NFC West. Let me ask you, Jerry, do you think that it was the 2-8 and eight outside of the division, or was it, you know, the twice benching of Jason Campbell and even dating back to 2009 with the benching of Jamarcus Russell? Um, both of those guys were, you know, uh, very 
well, Al Davis had their back, basically. I mean, they were his chosen picks. Um, and then there was, you know, the we're not losers comment that Cable made following uh, their win uh, at Kansas City in the final game of the season, which Al Davis took exception to as well. I mean, what do you think actually was the breaking point that made Davis say, you know what, Cable's not the guy? I think it was the benching of Jason Campbell. I think it was in the works already the day they hired Hugh Jackson. And what made me think something was cooking was the Raiders do not let assistant coaches do press conferences. They let Hugh Jackson do press conferences all year. But I think the Jason Campbell thing was what really said it. Cable dug his heels in on Campbell and Gratkowski, and I, the, I just think from that point on, he was on Al's list, so to speak. I mean, he benched Campbell the second game of the year, which you start to think about. It, there's a guy trying to learn a new offense. and It takes time. And then they benched him. And, you know, Gratkowski's a fan favorite, but he really doesn't do any much better and he's always injured so I think that benching of Campbell was a little early I don't believe that all oh, they benched him and he became competitive I I don't buy that no and and he didn't even make it through the second game he made it through you know the first half of the second game exactly and, being put down. and in the preseason he was only playing a quarter and a half or two quarters or three. Well, you're talking, the guy didn't even get a chance to learn the offense. If they really wanted him to learn the offense, they should have played him the whole preseason, you know, but you're the starter. So you go to the bench. Well, wait a minute, you know, this guy's trying to learn the offense. And I think Cable just was a uh, really fond of Gratkowski. And I think he pulled the plug way too soon on Campbell. And, uh, I really think that led to him being fired. And then plus the two and eight. That really did hurt because if they had just won one or two of those games, they'd be playing today. They would have been, they would have finished ahead of Kansas City. Well, there's no question. But getting back to Campbell, the last point on it, how much input did Campbell have in Campbell's acquisition, or was that completely an Al Davis call? I'm sure that was Al Davis' call. So moving forward then, I mean, is this Hugh Jackson's team? It's looking that way now because he's still under contract. They have to give him permission to interview. And nobody is in the foreseeable future even going to interview him. Right, and he actually said as much recently uh, that he has no plans to interview with another team. Uh, of course, he did interview with the 49ers this week, and it left a, reportedly a, a strong impression on them um, and seemed from all accounts to be their number two guy uh had Jim Harbaugh not accepted the position, he very well could have, you know, landed across the bay and taken that head coaching job. But as it turns out, it does go to Harbaugh. Does this slow down Al Davis's timetable to hire a replacement for uh, Cable, or you know, is is Al Davis just going to take his time regardless? He's notoriously slow. He will take his time. He does it every time. He's never hired a coach quickly. I think Hugh Jackson was more dissatisfied with Rooney Rule than anything else. Um, he's assessing his coaching staff without a head coach because Al, the head coach doesn't even pick the assistants. So we know who's calling the shot. <laughs> Till the grave, my friend. Till the grave. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And the funny thing is, his son Mark, who's you know in line to inherit the Raiders should that day come. He's making no bones about it. He has no intention of ever running the franchise. He's going to hire general managers. First one, first thing he's going to do, which is Al's son talking. <laughs> like father, not necessarily like son. You not know, not even close. <laughs> that's uh, that's like uh, here in in D.C. where I'm based. You know, there was uh, before Dan Snyder bought the team, Jack Kent Cook owned the Washington Redskins for years and years and years, and then after his passing John Kent Cook his son took over and uh, obviously just did not share the same philosophy and only you know, two years later sold the team to Snyder and uh, it's it's gone downhill in, in, in many people's eyes since then um, although as a business stand, as a business standpoint Snyder has turned the Redskins into quite the lucrative property um, well yeah but uh, with the size of that stadium Oh, you know, I think they're either the fourth or fifth most lucrative sports franchise in the entire world, regardless of sport. 
They pack them in there. Oh, they pack them in there. They sell private seat licenses, stadium sponsorships. I mean, it's it's just it's ridiculous the amount of money that he can generate. And they don't have a winning team. And they have them for a while. Well, you know, I think that the, the hiring of Mike Shanahan, despite all the quarterback drama that's been happening with the Washington Redskins this year, that's still going to put the team in a good position moving forward. And obviously Shanahan is somebody that you're familiar with, you know, given all of his years with the Denver Broncos. Um, it's just going to take some time for, for the situation right. here to, to iron itself out. And um, I actually see a lot of parallels between the Oakland Raiders and the Washington Redskins, uh, giving, you know, the uh, bold personality of the owner, the quarterback controversy, the constant coaching changes, you know, the fan disapproval, the losing record. You know, there's yeah. just, there's just a lot of parodies there, and not to mention, you know, Jason Campbell having played for both teams. Well, that's true. That that that's uh. It really is. I agree, and I I agree with you, Shanahan and Bruce Allen both. They're gonna you're gonna see another year of changes and adding their picking their people, and you'll see the influx of them next year. And I think they're on the right direction. I think they are, I think their expectations were a little too high this year because they got Don and the McNabb and thought, oh, the McNabb's not what he used to be. Billy knew that. Um, he was on pace before uh, he had a seat the final three games of the season. He was on pace to pass for over 4,000 yards, though. Yeah, he was. He he was. I, I mean, he still puts up some good numbers, but he just doesn't see. Of course, the Redskins need receivers really bad. Well, they, they have a couple of uh, uh, young, young prospects. Uh, this guy, Anthony Armstrong, um, who I'm privileged enough to do a, a show with, uh, every every week on the Sports Journey Broadcast Network. Thank you. There's a nice little plug. Uh, he's a young up and comer that um, that has a lot of potential, and there's a lot of excitement surrounding him here in Washington. But is there a guy out in Oakland that also has the same kind of buzz about him that you know he's going to be the next big thing? Well, I'll tell you, it's hard to say. McFadden became a big time item here this year but I think the person who had the most impact as far as from who is this to wow was Jacoby Ford he's the real deal and uh when he came started playing that was when they often started playing better and but as far as a huge impact player well, that's just a, that's hard to say right I don't see that right now well, you could argue that it's Rolando McLean. Of course, he was a first round. Well, you player. could, you could. The thing with McLean, and I think people didn't see it at first, he's a little slower than they thought. But I think if he trimmed down a couple twenty pounds or so, I think that would. And then he may be that guy. You're right. Everybody rants and raves about his knowledge and how quickly he's learning. And it was remarkable to play middle linebacker as a rookie. So, you know couple of years from now, he may be the man. Um, well, uh, you know, on that note, who do you think is the Raiders MVP? I mean, you talked a little bit about Darren McFadden today. I think that you're going to be hard-pressed to come up with a better name. For this past year, yeah, you'd have to say McFadden. He really did have a great year. And it wasn't just – the offensive line improved. Uh, Bell Deer was a huge acquisition and you know a rookie ended up playing left tackle there's another one to watch out for absolutely um but mcfadden learned something during the off season i don't know who worked with him or who made him change but the mcfadden in the past used to just run into people and first guy that touched him he'd go down well this year the mcfadden would dodge people and fake them out and avoid them and he turned into a great runner. 